Harvard Graduate School of Education. My name is David Hay, and uh, as one of the leaders of Queer Ed, a student organization here on campus, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to uh, this Ask With Forum. Now, this evening's Ask With Forum is a joint event in a new speaker series being launched this year called Outfront LGBTQ Leaders to Learn From, which is definitely a mouthful. Perhaps we would have thought of that before we titled the, the, the forum series. Um, at any rate, Outfront uh, aims to elevate national and international conversations by amplifying leaders making a difference and advancing the movement. Leaders that you're going to hear from in just a moment. Uh, I'd like to briefly recognize the Queer Ed leadership team and advisors without whom uh, this wouldn't be possible. So the leadership team, Andrew Rayner, you can stand and give us a little Vanna wave, thank you. Uh, Jessica Boyle, thank you. And Shravya, I don't know if Shravya, she's on her way. Um, and then our advisors, Liz Thurston, <laughs> Kevin Bame, who I think is on his way, and Tracy Jones, also on her way. Um, so before we, we officially get started, I want to invite uh, you to several more opportunities that are happening yet this week. Uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. in Larson Hall, which is just across the street, uh, we have a, a panel titled Out in K-12, Working as an LGBTQ Professional, specifically targeted at folks who are planning to go back out into the K-12 workforce and navigate uh, both career and uh, identifying as LGBTQ. Uh, then on Friday, we invite you to participate in the National Day of Silence. The Day of Silence is a student-led national event that brings attention to anti-LGBTQ name-calling, bullying, and harassment in schools. Students from middle school to college and grad school uh, take a vow of silence in an effort to encourage schools and classmates to address the problem of anti-LGBTQ behavior by illustrating the silencing effect of bullying and harassment on LGBT st students. So at the end of the day, what that means is look for tables in the front of Gutman Library all day Friday and take the pledge to use silence on Friday to bring voice to LGBTQ youth in America's schools. And now, the conclusion of my very brief remarks, I assure you. It's my distinct honor to introduce our moderator for the evening, a former middle school English teacher himself, former assistant dean at UCLA, a graduate of Harvard Graduate School of Education, the current chair of the Harvard University-wide Teaching and Learning Consortium, and our very own associate dean for teaching and learning. The list is much, much longer, I assure you. But please join me in welcoming our very own moderator, Matt Miller. Thank you, Thank you David. Uh, thanks to you and to Queer Ed for your leadership. It's great um, to have this series this year. Um, it's my honor to welcome all of you and to moderate a panel of experts, a distinguished panel, um, on the subject of the fight for marriage equality. And tonight we want to explore the lessons of this movement for the continuing struggle for equality for LGBTQ people and their families, and importantly, the crucial implications for all of us as educators. Um, but first, I'd like to share a few statistics. In 2001, according to Pew Research, 57% of Americans opposed same-sex marriage. In a similar poll, 14 years later, 55% of Americans supported marriage equality for same-sex couples. Still, a recent GLAAD poll found that 50% of non-LGBTQ Americans today believe that, quote, gay people have the same rights as everyone else. Um, and in that same poll, and this is very important for educators to hear, um, in measuring the extent to which certain situations made non-LGBTQ Americans either very uncomfortable or somewhat uncomfortable, the situation that made 37% of parents very or somewhat uncomfortable was, quote, learning my child had a lesson on LGBTQ history mm. in their school. Okay, that 37% was the highest percentage of discomfort of mm. any of the situations that were asked about in that survey. Mm. Um, and so those statistics, coupled with the steady stream of news items on state and local efforts um, to undermine rights, make clear that while we have a lot to celebrate tonight, um, I think that uh, it reminds us there's a lot of unfinished work. Um, as I introduce our panelists, I just want to say we bring a lot of fascinating history-making people 
uh, to campus, but I have not, and I see a reserve spot for my husband, Terry, who will be here in a moment, um, but I have never had the privilege of, where is he? Oh, there he's back there. Hi, hon. Um, <laughs> you're not sitting where you're supposed to. Yeah, you're not where, <laughs> tell, we're gonna tell Jody. <laughs> um, but I have never had the experience of being in a room with people who literally were fighting for my life. People who did work to advance rights that I now enjoy and that we, um, as a married couple, um, owe gratitude to people sitting next to us on stage for that. Um, so I just want to start the panel by a very personal, from Terry and me, thank you. Um, and I imagine there are other people watching via video or sitting in the audience who may have the same sort of thank you to offer to some of our panelists. Um, so I'd first like to welcome Julie Goodridge, uh, who was the lead plaintiff in the historic case Goodridge v. Massachusetts. Department of Public Health. The November 2003 decision was the first by a US state's highest court to find that same-sex couples had the right to marry. Julie is also a pioneer in the field of socially responsible investing and as a founder and CEO of North Star Asset Management, um, her work stands at the forefront of progressive wealth management. North Star, uh, as you may know, through the proxy process has extended protections for LGBTQ employees at numerous companies, uh, including FedEx. Uh, I'm also proud to say that Julie, like Chief Justice Margaret Marshall, um, who wrote the Goodridge decision, uh, is a master's alum of HGSE. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Yeah. You didn't know that? Oh, good. <laughs> that was good. Um, next. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mark Solomon. Mark is a nationally recognized political strategist and campaign leader with over 25 years of experience in campaign management, policy development and execution, <laughs> communications leadership, and field mobilization. Uh, he was one of the key architects of the marriage equality movement, having worked as the national campaign director of Freedom to Marry. His book, Winning Marriage, the inside story of how same-sex couples took on the politicians and the pundits and won, has been described by US News and World Report as, quote, a playbook for progressive causes. Um, and it was named a best book of 2014 by Slate, which called it the definitive political history of marriage equality. Mark is also a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome, Mark. Thanks. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Tim McCarthy, award-winning scholar, teacher, and activist. Uh, Tim holds faculty appointments in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard in the History and Literature program, the Kennedy School, the Business School. He is also an honorary super citizen of the Ed School. His <laughs> husband, uh, CJ, is CJ here tonight? Yeah. Hi, CJ. Um, he's sitting where he's supposed he's, to be. This is the first there. time for everything. <laughs> <laughs> CJ is also a proud Ed School alum. Um, and Tim is the founding director of the Sexuality, Gender, and Human Rights Program at the Carr Center for Human Rights at the Kennedy School. He's also the Stanley Patterson Professor of American History in the Boston Clemente course in the Humanities in Dorchester. His fifth book, Stonewall's Children, Living History in the Age of Liberation, Loss, and Love, will be published later this year. Tim attended Harvard College and earned his master's and doctoral degrees from Columbia. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. Nice to be here. Okay. I want to start by taking us back to the watershed case in Massachusetts and start with you, Julie, and actually ask you what it was like to be a plaintiff in this case. Well, before I say that, I just want you to know that Ed Balmelli was also a plaintiff in this case. He works for Harvard now, and he's sitting in the front row where he should be sitting. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Ed. <Woo>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was um, not something I thought I was getting myself into. Um, you know, it was a very uh, kind of personal, um, it was a personal journey that both Hillary and I entered primarily because we felt as though we wanted to try to create a family and protect a family. We had a daughter, Annie, who at the time, I think we, we filed uh, was around five or six years old. Um, is this mic working? Because it's yeah. like, you know, that's, there's a scene in a movie where she goes, you know, back and forth. <laughs> like anyway, um, so we wanted to protect our family. We realized, you know, we had health care proxies and all the sort of financial kinds of arrangements. Um, and 
I gave birth to Annie and Hillary had adopted Annie, but we had no legal relationship to one another. So um, that's really what we wanted. And we wanted to be like everybody else. I mean, not like everybody, everybody else, but we wanted to at least <coughs> have Annie have a family experience that was similar to that of her peers. And so we came in with this kind of wide-eyed, yeah, why not? Um, and applied for a marriage license in the city of Boston where there was no rule that said that two people of the same sex couldn't marry. Um, but so it didn't say that we could either. And so we went down to apply for a marriage license with Mike and Ed and um, we were denied. And that was kind of the beginning of, of the case. So we went and spoke with our the genius, um, Mary Bonato, and mm -hmm. she formed a, a group of us. There were seven plaintiff couples, mm -hmm. and I, you know, to this day, I'm so thankful that there were seven plaintiff couples because, you know, the stress was tremendous, and yeah. um, and we filed suit in 2001. Uh, the interesting thing was we had a press conference. Ed will remember this. We had a press conference um, to which I think maybe. You know, somebody from the Boston Phoenix came. I think there was a guy from the Herald. You know, a couple of, you know, no one came to the press conference. We were all ready. We had nice outfits on and we were ready to go. We had our opening statements and there was no story. And in mm. fact, I think buried somewhere in the globe was something. Um, but it was, an, it was a non-issue. No one thought anything of it. It wasn't until... Um, we got kicked up to the Supreme Judicial Court that mm -hmm. people started, which was Margaret Marshall's court, that people started to take notice and, mm -hmm. you know, pay attention to us. Yeah. And so, Mark, uh, how did you get involved in the case and what, <clears throat> what was your role and uh, both with the case and the work that followed? Sure. So I got involved. I um, actually moved to Boston to go to graduate school, to go to the Kennedy School. <clears throat> and it was right around the time when uh, the case was filed. And it just seemed on so many different levels to me as uh, someone who'd been doing politics, political strategy for a while, um, and someone who was, who was gay, um, this just seemed, it, it seemed so right on so many different levels. So I started volunteering with a grassroots group called the Massachusetts Freedom to Marry Coalition. And you know, it's funny, these days everybody's like, well, you guys were bombarded with money. You didn't know what to do with it all. You know, it's like you. And I was like, I remember going to prides and selling uh, pieces of wedding cake uh, to, to, you know, for uh, to raise money because people thought this idea was so uh, wild and crazy. Um, but uh, you know, I stayed involved. And then when we, you know, as a, as a volunteer, and then when we won, I remember I was sitting at the uh, at the Kennedy School uh, for whatever reason. I was in there at eight in the morning, which must have been like a rarity. But I was getting my emails, and I remember an email came over the, uh, came to me from uh, Gary Busick, who was the, then the executive director of GLAAD, saying uh, that today is the day. We'd been waiting and waiting, and today was the, gonna be the day for the decision. And um, I remember they, uh, I got a call a little bit later. Uh, the decision would come down at 10 in the morning. I got a call, and I, um, to go over to New England Cable News to sort of give live, uh, um, my live commentary as the decision came down. And I remember I was wearing this really ugly plaid shirt and I was like, damn, I, I live in Jamaica Plain, I don't have time to go home and change. But that's an aside, that wasn't important. <laughs> it was then. It was, I know, it was all time. about what you were wearing. Know, and, you know, Holly Gunner said to, came up to me like a couple months ago, someone who was involved in the marriage fight, and she's like, you were wearing that ugly plaid shirt, weren't you? <laughs> you see? Like, see? Um, but, <laughs> but what I remember most from that, you know, obviously it was incredibly powerful and, and just a, amazing moment. I was on the phone with Glad and they were on the phone with Mary Bonato who was down at the courthouse and you know and she's like leafing through and they're like it's a win, it's a win, it's a win and then I'm wired up and I go on TV and this, I remember the first, I remember the, the, the intensity of the opposition. Um, I remember a statement immediately from the president, President Bush, uh, a statement from Governor Romney, from the Catholic hierarchy and on and on. Um, saying that this decision wouldn't stand, this uh, activist judges in Massachusetts aren't gonna change marriage for everyone. And then even more, um, I guess even more painfully in some respects, and this shows how much of a hill we had to climb, um, you know, the, the Democratic politicians in the state of Massachusetts and nationally were running away from this decision 
as quickly as they could. Yeah. You know, the Senate president, mm -hmm. the attorney general, um, the House speaker was violently anti-gay. Uh, you know, all of them opposed the decision. And even, uh, uh, to put it into today's context, even uh, John Kerry uh, issued a statement that day saying that he opposed uh, the ruling. And um, he ultimately came out in support of a constitutional amendment in the state to take it away. So we were really, um, you know, we had a long political uh, road to hoe. And I know for a lot of people now, um, it's hard to imagine that that's where, that's where the political mm -hmm. world was back then, but it is. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big story, um, you know, about how we, how we built power and won that, you know, you can read in my book. Um, yeah. And I can yeah, talk we want to talk about that playbook. I can talk for a long time yeah. about it, but uh, it, was a, it was a hugely emotional and powerful uh, time. Mm -hmm. And just to give a, a couple quick anecdotes, I mean, one mm -hmm. was, I remember, um, you know, May 17th, the day that the first marriage was started, uh, um, to, just to give a sense of how intense it was, uh, the Boston Police Department had sharpshooters on roofs all over the city of Boston because they were concerned that somebody was going to take matters into their own hands and uh, from our opponents. Because I think intuitively they knew that once same-sex couples started to marry, people would see what BS our opponent's argument was and that we really did want to marry out of a sense of love and commitment and, mm. you know, uh, want to take care of our families. And... Um, so it was, it was really, I mean, it was, and, and all the lead up to it was just, it's hard to even describe uh, the level of intensity of, uh, of, those, uh, of those moments. I, I remember one time when, uh, I remember when you said it, uh, one of the rallies in the State House, you know, we'd have 5,000 people yeah. flooding the State House, and, and uh, I think you said, um, you know, I, I, I'm confident uh, we're going to win because love always wins. And I was like, well, that sounds, I was like, I hope that's true. It was, uh, um, but it was, so it's, you, you know, you should watch like old uh, reels from, uh, from those days because it was super intense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tim, how do you remember those days? And uh, I also want to say, while you take us back to kind of your own connection, I'm also hoping you as the historian on the panel can mm -hmm. also put it a little bit in context for us in terms of well, larger uh, movement. Yeah, I'm glad you prompted me to do that because it was where I was going to go because I have a slightly different way of entering yeah. this history and of being part of living it. Uh, but the first thing I want to say is that I was very struck by that opening uh, data point of 37% of people are most uncomfortable when their kids learn an LGBT history lesson. I thought I had enough of a problem being a homosexual uh, in American society. Now I'm a homosexual historian. So the, <laughs> I, I, the, the anxiety doubles down when I talk about what I do professionally as well as you know, what I do privately and personally. Um, <laughs> So, sorry babe, I've already embarrassed you. Uh, <laughs> so, I do come at this as a, as a historian. It's interesting that I, when the Goodrich decision came down, uh, and I can't believe we've never met. I'm so, mm. so honored to meet you. And this one and I go back a long time, but I'm really honored to meet you and be just near you here tonight. Um, Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but when I heard about this, I was in North Carolina. I, had, uh, I was living in Chapel Hill at the time on a, on a, a fellowship. And um, in not a particularly great time in my life, personally, uh, and I had, I had left Harvard as, uh, as a graduate student tutor here, and I had done some uh, work here teaching, and I needed to get out and finish my dissertation and also get away from what had been a very difficult uh, number of years post 9-11 leading up to the Iraq war when I had become a very outspoken peace activist, uh, very critical of the Bush administration and had been um, blacklisted by Lynn Cheney in uh, the mm -hmm. fall of 2001. I was number 32 on a list of 117 American academics who were short on patriotism. Uh, now that's an honor, it's a line on my CV, yeah. but then it was a uh, cause for death threats. <laughs> but I really needed to get away and I had not been part of the LGBT movement because I took me a long time to come out. I was just trying to stay on this side of the grave and to yeah. reckon with my identity, uh, having grown up in a very, you know, sort of traditional Irish, Italian, Catholic, athletic home, um, where being gay or being queer was just off the table. There was no discussion of that, no viability of that. And so it took me a long time to actually love myself, much less be part of a movement so that other people could have the right to love each other. And so I want to be really honest about that, that I didn't, I wasn't born an activist, right? You know, I, I came into this because I was so moved by the courage 
of people who were my people. Um, as often as the inspiration for becoming part of movements is that you see other people's courage and you want to be near that because it's infectious. That was true of the black civil rights movement, the long black freedom struggle generally. It's true of the women's movement. It's true of the labor movement. It's true of all great movements. The people who have the capacity to step out in front first are those uh, who not only tr blaze the, the, the trails, but also inspire those of us to follow and to join. And so these two folks up here were very much inspirations for me. But I was in North Carolina at the time when the Goodrich decision came down, and I had heard inklings about it because I had a bunch of queer friends from this area in Boston and Massachusetts obviously was a, has always been a very important central location, a kind of core of the larger movement dating back to uh, the, the pre-Stonewall days, frankly, and on through the AIDS crisis and other iterations and twists and turns of our history and our movement. And um, so I knew about it, and then when it came down, I was very, I, I loved it, and I remember reading those beautiful words, uh, Margaret Marshall's language. You know, and as a South African, right, I, I, I felt the weight of her words on this issue, um, having been an anti-apartheid <coughs> activist in college. That's actually how I got, started to cut my teeth as an activist, was the South African Solidarity Movement in the 80s and 90s. And, to have this South African woman, this progressive, this ally, write these words that were so specific to LGBT folks in Massachusetts, but also so transcendent in terms of how they issued a kind of another clarion call for justice and for equality, um, to me was just inspiring, especially living in North Carolina at the time which of course is now in the news, and I'm sure we'll talk more about we will. the Tar Heel State. But, um, you know, so when I came back, I was there for two years, and in the spring of 2004, one of the things that struck me is that the marriage licenses uh, were signed, the first ones in Cambridge, at a huge party with cakes and everything. Ken Reeves, who married us, was one of the people who signed those first marriage licenses, he's on city council. Um, and it was, it was so moving to me that it was May 17th, because May 17th, 2004, is the 50th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And that wasn't, I'm sure, a coincidence. And so as someone who's a historian who got his start, not only in anti-racist activism and, and South African solidarity activism, but in African-American history and politics and social movements in the United States, there was something about that intersection and that convergence. Living in North Carolina as a Yankee transplant, newly queer and out, but long uh, committed to the cause of racial justice, um, that, that spoke to me and made me want to come home. And so I did, and I came back in 2005, and, um, and, and, and just after that 2004 election where all those ballot initiatives that were reacting to Goodrich, if Massachusetts does this, it's gonna be infectious. It's gonna infect us. Our states will be next. Ugh. A new domino theory. And, and, and they were so afraid of that, and I remember being outraged by that, and the reaction to this ruling, this advance of justice and equality and rights in Massachusetts as somehow a threat to other parts of the nation and other parts of the body politics seemed to me to resonate deeply with my understanding of all of the backlashes in African American history that have come at moments of victory and at moments of triumph and at moments of great leaps forward. And to me, that backlash was what called me to the movement that I wanted to fight and keep fighting for this and lots of other things, as I'd always done in other realms, so that we can fend off the forces of reaction, which are at least as powerful in American political culture, historically, as the forces of progress. Mm. Mm. I actually, yeah, I want to say something because, um, first of all, this is bringing me back, right? Um, <laughs> but I was thinking about this 30, what, 36 or 33 or 34% issue. I mean, part of what drove us was really this concept of really caring so deeply about the experience that our daughter was having every single day. Mm. Um, and mm. uh, earlier I was talking to uh, the pot, the other podcast person and yeah, I was saying, yeah, and, and I was saying that um, you know, Annie went to private school, started as, as she had just turned four that day and went to the after school program, which not that many kids went to the after school program because back then, you know, their moms didn't even work at this school. It was kind of insane. So that we, she was already different because 
she, she <coughs> was going to the after school program. But a second grader came up to her and said, you have two moms and that's not right. And we didn't find out about this until Hillary was reading some, you know, book that at that time there weren't even a lot of books. You know, there was Heather Has Two Mommies or something. You can't read that because it's talking about, you know, sperm and things like that. You don't want to talk to your four-year-old about that. I mean, that's a whole... So, but there was a book called, you know... Turn one, into a fish. Yeah. <laughs> one Dad, Two Dad, Red Dad, Blue Dad. And, and Annie, at the end of that book said, and it was an Allison publication, at the end of that book, Annie said, that's, you can't have two dads, that's not right. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, was, it was hugely upsetting. So, so you know, mm -hmm. I had to sort of, t I had to become like this activist in my child's classroom at this very sort of ritzy private school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the next thing I know, I'm like, doing bibliography research and coming up with a bunch of books and talking to things. And I said, you know, this happened. I went to the head of the school and said, hey, this happened. And the head of the school, you know, and the, and the head of the after school program brought out some book about different kinds of families. And our family wasn't one of the different kinds of families in the book. Mm. And that's still partially true. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so when you think about these kinds of drivers, you're talking about what it was like on May 17th. You know, when we went to get our marriage license, and we brought, you know, we were we were with Mike and Ed and um, David and and Rob in the bowels of City Hall with Mayor Menino, and he's got all sorts of food and a big giant TV, and we're there with Annie and the nannies, and the mayor loved Annie too. He loved Annie. <laughs> But, but anyway, so we, we do all that and we go up to get our marriage licenses and there is, you know, scaffolding up to the second floor filled with reporters from around the world, mm. you know, on both sides. I mean, and then we have to go through like a daisy chain with police escorts to get, to get our license, you know, to have the waiver so we can actually get married on May 17th. And, you know, Hillary and I are freaking out. I mean, there's this great photo where we're like, you know, this. Mary Bonato's trying to look composed. And Annie's like, as, as if it's the best day of her life, right? So this is really, you know, with all the history, this is about, you know, real people, real experiences yeah, yeah. every single day. And... Um, you know, and I, I don't want to do too much of a segue to your next thing because I probably don't even remember what it was. But, but the one thing I do remember is when I was sitting in the Supreme Court, you know, and I got in there not because I was a Goodridge, mind you. I got in there because I paid some guy to stand in line for me. Um, for three days, um, <laughs> but anyway, for the yeah, decision. for the Supreme oral Court, arguments. yes, where Mary Bonata was making the yeah. oral arguments, and when Scalia <coughs> was talking to her, and I just thought, God rest his soul, <laughs> ding dong, the witch is dead. Okay, so but when I was listening to that, I was sitting with my head in my lap, sobbing. Because I couldn't believe that my daughter was going to grow up with this idiot, you know, as a Supreme Court justice of our country. You know, so it's really personal. And, you know, yeah, there's a lot of history and a lot of stuff. But after that decision came down, when we, when we won that one too, I thought, wait a second, we only won marriage. Mm -hmm. That's all we've won. We still don't have the same rights as everybody else in the whole rest of the country, including Massachusetts. Right. So, yeah. right. Well, let's here think, we are. So those struggles continue. And uh, so one question I have, and um, I think any of you could take this, but I'm thinking, Mark, you may have a place to, uh, to start us off, is after the moment that we are just thinking about of getting that marriage license, right. then the, the immediate years that follow, take us inside of your playbook. I mean, really, yeah. What is happening? What are you doing on the ground? How are you sort of managing and fending off the various constitutional convention threats and other things that are going on? Take mm -hmm. us into that period of it time. Was, it was intense. Um, what we had to do, I mean, mm -hmm. my total all-out focus from the date of the decision, November 18, 2003, until it ended up being June 2007, was to 
stave off a constitutional amendment in the state of Massachusetts that would take away the, the freedom to marry. And people, you know, some people would say now, well, it never would have happened in Massachusetts <coughs> in the past. Well, in 2008, it passed in California, so it, it could have passed. Right. Um, and so what we did is we had to get organized, and we had to, and we organized throughout this state. We, um, and, and one of the things I like talking about in my book is I really wanted to show how this work was done. And, and um, you know, I wanted to explain that while the <coughs> ideals of civil rights are very lofty and, um, and noble, the work of civil rights is, hard, is a hard slog. And, you know, we had canvassers who were going into conservative parts of the state to collect postcards to give to their state legislator, and they were chased down the street by homophobes, and I remember probably 10 dog bites. I mean, all sorts of horrible, you know, difficulties. Um, and, you know, we were, we were looking for every possible hook we could find. We had to get 150 out of 200 of the legislators on Beacon Hill to vote against a constitutional amendment <coughs> to keep it off the ballot. So we had to get 75% to vote against an amendment to keep it off the ballot. And um, the first, one of the first things we did, because we knew the power of the married couples and the power of their stories, is that my dear colleague, still a great friend, Amy Mello, who was our field director, um, went to the, um, Depart the Bureau of Vital Statistics in Dorchester in this like horribly bureaucratic office uh, with a team of volunteers. And they went, and they went through every marriage license that in 2004, and they were, you know, these were like the original copies, so they could only take out like two or three at a, at a time, and they, you know, they couldn't make photocopies, so they brought their laptops and they typed in the information of names that sounded like they were uh, same-sex couples, and they mm. had, you know, they got a database of about 8,000 same-sex couples, and then we organized them by legislative district, and we sent them all a letter, and then we, for the ones who were living in important legislative districts, we got on the phone and we called them, and we called them over and over, and, and we organized, you know, we organized, ultimately organized 12 affiliates around the state, you know, Quincy for Marriage Equality, and Worcester, and Springfield, and it was really about building political power in every part of the state, and in Fall River, and New Bedford, and it was hard, you know, really hard, challenging um, work. Our opponents, um, had this amazing base, um, and it was the, the Catholic hierarchy and the Catholic Church, and they had, you know, Massachusetts is the second most Catholic state in the country, and happily, um, a good number of Catholics uh, didn't listen to the hierarchy on matters of, uh, you know, on matters of LGBT equality or on matters of sex in general, and I was one of them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your support. And uh, we also, <laughs> and we also, um, at the same time, and uh, you know, I, I've thought about this in, the, in light of the what should we call it, the movie that's been out uh, about the sex scandal uh, spotlight. spotlight. You know, that we had this huge scandal in the church that really diminished its political power right around the same time. But they, nevertheless, had this, you know, had these built-in you know, organizing efforts. I remember when they collected signatures to get an amendment on the ballot. Um, I remember they sent petitions home with fourth graders and fifth graders to get their moms and dads to sign their petition at Catholic schools. So we, the other thing that um, was crucial, so it was building political power um, by, it was ultimately by getting as many people as we could, constituents to weigh in with their lawmakers, getting same-sex couples to sit down with their lawmakers and share their stories. That was the heart of our uh, of our work was having couples and families share their stories. And I can't tell you how many lawmakers changed their positions Absolutely. over the course of time after yeah. those meetings. Yeah. And it was, you know, you, you guys work with, with you know, our, our educators, or many of you are educators, and it was many times lawmakers would say, you know, I, um, I sat home with this couple, and once I met their kids and looked into their kids' eyes, I thought they were just like my kids, and I couldn't treat them any differently from my own kids, because they could relate to these kids, because they have kids too. They might not be able to relate exactly to a same-sex couple, but they could certainly relate to their kids. Um, so that was at the heart of our organizing work. And then we got involved electorally too. Um, and that's, you know, has it been another crucial element of the work over the past number of years, and certainly here in Massachusetts. You know, the rule number one about an elected official is uh, um, that their top priority um, in almost every case, is to continue to be an elected official. <laughs> and if you, um, you know, if you're asking them to do something 
where they think that they're going to lose their jobs if they do what you're asking them to do, you're going to lose because they're not mm -hmm. going to do it. There's there's certainly a few exceptions, but you know, the, mm -hmm. the cor super courageous ones were the lawmakers from Cambridge and Jamaica playing that were going to lose their jobs anyway. So it was, you know, it, it, people were facing a genuine, um, you know, in, in outlying areas, they were like uh, Republicans. Like, if I do this, am I going to lose my seats? And in Massachusetts, there's that. It, for many of them, it's their full-time job, and it's their family. So we had to prove that um, you could uh, vote our way and get reelected. And then we had to make some examples of some people who voted against us and knock them out. Um, mm -hmm. So that was also. But what was the the amendment? There was some Lees, the something something. Le tra who, what what was that? That well, was that was, that was, was a so-called compromise that would have gotten rid of yeah. marriage and replaced it with civil, civil unions. Union. That's the one that uh, John Kerry came out in support of while he was running. It was, like it was the compromise measure meant, to, so, yeah, meant it was a, to be a compromise. Right, and it was and that was tough because. Um, you know, so many different leaders. I mean, that's when I had a, I remember having a crisis of conscience then because a lot of people in our community were saying, look, you know, this thing is gonna be taken away from us and if at least if we have civil unions, we'll have all the protections. Um, and it's, um, you know, it was it was really a big debate even within our own community. Le legislative leaders who were our, our friends, you know, with quotation marks around a little bit, were saying, you know, come on guys, you, sh you should go for this because then, you know, we know there's gonna be a vote on this at the ballot and at least if you lose the vote, you're gonna have uh, these benefits. Uh, and um, there, it's funny, I was just visiting this past weekend with, uh, with, um, with a friend of mine who's, who's now the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, and, he was, we've been close friends for years and years, and he, I remember talking to him about, about that, and I remember he was the one who told me, he's like, he's like uh, civil unions are about a sheet of paper and marriage is about love. He's like, you can't, uh, you know, you gotta keep, keep fighting, you know, don't, uh, don't settle. And I was like, all right. So that's when I got my, mm. I mean, I was probably like crying in bed for the, for the rest of that weekend, and then I got my uh, backbone <laughs> up and went back to but work. When, but when that <laughs> amendment happened, that was a really interesting point. I didn't really understand, you know, I'm like, we need marriage, that's all there is, I don't have time for this. You know, that's kind of was my attitude. <laughs> but um, That's why you filed the lawsuit. Right, right. right. <laughs> but, but I remember having to go on the Emily Rooney show, mm. and it was the sure. same time those guys yeah. were mm. on, and they were supposed to be talking about their amendments. So we're sitting in the green room, and I'm looking at I'm like, you guys are trying to throw this whole thing under the bus because you're uncomfortable with it yeah. and my daughter is you know this is what she needs you know this is what we need to protect her so what's that about but it was like you know they were machines yeah. I would never have been able to do your job mm. yeah I remember never. I remember when Tom, Tom Finneran was a speaker of the house and he was oh virally anti-gay and I remember Terrible. trying to talk to his attorney his uh, chief counsel about the stuff and his attorney I remember this guy's like uh my biggest, he's like, my biggest worry, I gotta be honest with you, my biggest worry, Mark, is you're gonna have a couple guys who are buddies, and they're gonna get married just to, uh, you know, just to get the health care. And I was like, mm. I was like, yeah, you get, you know, your constituents down in Dorchester, two uh, Irish Catholic guys are gonna get married so they can get health care together. They're gonna sit at the bar and I was like. that's a huge thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's taking over the country. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> not, not, not. So then I, I went home and I, mm. I Punched my pillow a few, you know, a few times, and went back out. Uh, mm. So yes, it was. There were lots of uh, frustrating conversations. Mm. <laughs> so Tim, when you you hear about the sort of strategy uh, from that period of time after uh, mm -hmm. after the decision, uh, take us into today, mm -hmm. and um, in thinking about the lessons from rights movements more generally, in mm -hmm. terms of the kinds of electoral and other mm -hmm. um, and other um, elements of the playbook we were just talking about. Yeah. First of all. What's going on today? Uh, which we're all trying to keep up, I think, mm. with the news as every day produces a new uh, action and reversal uh, in states, uh, in states yeah. particularly in the South. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, is that part of the, the, that's the ground for the next fight? Is that right? And then yeah. what it's lessons what do we, we take went from through. that? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, those of us who've been paying attention and who have been in the you know, in various, involved in the larger movement in various ways, um, I think have seen this coming a long time. I mean, there was, a, there, there, we've already been through this multiple times, but there's a specific instance, which I referenced before, where we've been through this. In 2004, there were two dozen, I believe, state ballot initiatives right. that were placed on the ballots in states right. 
engineered by Ken Melman, the closet queen of the Bush administration, who's now out and funding all sorts of lovely things to make amends. <laughs> um, it's his penance. Um, but the, he also refused to debate me at the business school a couple years ago, but I'm not <laughs> bitter about that. Um, <laughs> but the, um, he knew better. And the, but so it can, the Bush administration orchestrated a state by state. They did their own counter organizing, right, in the wake of Goodrich, because they were afraid that Goodrich was going to set in motion this domino effect of marriage equality across the nation, which of course it did. They were right. Um, but their fear led them to organize at the state level to get these ballot initiatives passed. And I think all but one passed. No, and they, they all, they all they passed. passed. I think they all passed. And You're so defining marriage as a man and a woman, this sort of traditional uh, thing. And this was all a backlash against what had happened in Massachusetts and the, the right. possibility that this would set this revolution in motion. And so we've been here before. If we didn't think that the Obergefell ruling, which is a, a triumphant very important moment. I mean, it's it's one of the great watershed Supreme Court decisions on uh, with respect to civil rights and the sort of equality of citizenship that we have in American history. Like, there's no way around that. Right? We know that the Obergefell decision is going to go down in history among that sort of suite of important cases that have advanced the rights of citizenship for um, for disenfranchised groups. And so. We, we knew something was coming. And so what's happened, I think, what's happening now is that the right has gotten their butt kicked <laughs> by the queers on marriage. Yes. And they know it. So Love that. they know it. They've gotten their butts kicked. They were afraid we are going to do something else to their butts. We kicked their butts. <laughs> <laughs> and and we did we won and 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 and, and we and and everyone knows that and so they have to find a way to do a couple of things they have to find a way to reframe the debate in a way that because we reframe the debate it used to be gay marriage it used to be you know gay and lesbian marriage same sex marriage then it became marriage equality right we got the queer out of that and we framed it as marriage equality marriage traditional awesome unit of the family civilization equality principal ideal of America, yoke them together, who can be opposed to that, mm -hmm. right? Because they're not, you know, now that we're thinking about like what is core to society and what is core to the nation, not who are these freak shows who are trying to molest our children. And so we reframed that successfully, so they had to reframe it, and that's where you get religious liberty. What do they have left? They got religious, and they always got freedom, because they always talking about freedom, right? And so they yoke freedom and religion together, and then that'll be a winning framing for this new political struggle to roll back whatever we can after we've gotten a licking. And so that's one thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening is a new boogeyman has emerged, and that's the trans community, right? The LGBT community, more broadly, gays and lesbians, of course, we all are second-class citizens still, regardless of whether or not we're married, and we have a long way to go, all of us. But what has happened is that the trans boogeyman, boogie person, right, has now emerged as the new enemy of the state within the body politic, the new contaminant, mm. the new threat. And it, and it gins up all the same kinds of historic discourses about harming children, molestation. Right now we're defending women in women's bathrooms. Now it's a feminist crusade. Watch it whenever the Republicans and the right wing start talking about things in terms of women's rights, because you know it ain't nothing about women's <laughs> rights, right? <laughs> but that, that you know that. And what, but that's what they're doing. And so these religious liberty bills framed as such, and do not ever call them religious liberty bills, and do not ever call them bathroom bills. That's their language. Take a page out of, out of George Lakoff, the great linguist from Berkeley, who says, do not think of an elephant, don't talk like an elephant if you don't mean an elephant. So don't use their language. Bathroom bills and religious liberty bills is what they want us to call this. And so I call them hate bills. We've got hate crimes, we've got hate bills. And this is what's happening at the state level again we, almost 10 years later, a little bit over 10 years later, we've already been, we've had a rehearsal for this with those ballot initiatives in 2004. And so this, these, these hate bills, masked as religious liberty bills, called colloquially bathroom bills, which are really about using the new boogeyman of the trans person to gin up all the ancient fears and prejudices against us, which are really about us being sexually deviant and a harm to children and somehow non-normative, right? And that's what's, that's what's happening and it's working 
in some ways, but it's also not working. We see the, the pushback, we see the corporate pressure, we see the boycotts, we see all of these other ways in which, uh, Springsteen, <laughs> right? Brian Adams, bless his soul. Nobody, <laughs> nobody cares about Brian Adams, but he, yeah. he canceled his concert too, <laughs> right? But, but Springsteen, all these folks, all these folks, bless his heart, he's on our side, bless his heart, as they say in the South. In North Carolina. So he canceled it because nobody was going to his concert. But what I want to yeah. say, this yeah. is, and the, the, I want to make another point about this because I think it's important for us as we yeah. celebrate the marriage equality movement. The marriage equality movement was, was part of a movement, right? Marriage equality was, was one very important piece, is one very important piece of a larger struggle for justice for queer folks. And it did require, and I think it did have the effect of, of taking up a lot of, of room in the movement and in, in our politics, such that when people talk about LGBT rights, they often are using it as a synonym with marriage equality. Marriage equality is part of LGBT rights. And one of the things that I think has been neglected in this campaign, very successful campaign as part of the movement for marriage equality, has been the more vulnerable members of the LGBT community and trans folks and trans folks of color are principally among them. And while our eye was on a particular prize, I think the movement in the community and society more broadly has left the most vulnerable among us out in a place of vulnerability where they are now being used as the principal boogie folks in a new crusade that's meant to attack all of us. Mm. And so we are, I think, late to the game in terms of the solidarity that we should have been expressing well, all along. I'm not saying so, everyone did, but so but I, I actually want to. So here's this is interesting because, you know, we got a lot of shit for the marriage thing because yep. it took up a lot of space you know all of a sudden hrc is loving the idea of marriage even though they hated right. the idea at the beginning you know once we won mm -hmm. they were all about funding mm -hmm. right so i think that that's definitely true and i also think that because for several years we have been talking about lgbt that we have there has been a lifting up and a consciousness that has made it impossible for us to ignore those members of our community who are trans. Mm. And I think it's been important. I know that the work that I do, you know, that's just been a part of what we're doing. I know that, you know, it's made a huge difference to people that are, you know, college age. I look at Annie and, you know, she's a member of the trans community at mm -hmm. Oberlin. Well, you know, Everybody's practically trans at Oberlin, but you know she's a member, mm. and she and she's fighting for it and mm. believes in it very yeah, strongly. Absolutely. My and too. you know, I remember when that whole thing was going down with Mass Equality was doing a fundraiser, let's say for Therese Murray, mm -hmm. and the whole thing was around the trans bill. Well, we still don't have a trans right. bill, right? right? And why don't we? Because everybody's so freaked out about it because they're calling it, as you say, the bathroom bill. And Annie went in to this fundraiser. I said, here, mm. put these clothes on. We're going to this fundraiser. And she goes up to Therese Marie and she says, there is a person in my school who came out to me as trans. This is somebody who was in the sixth grade. Mm. And Annie just, she said, so I really think we need the trans bill passed. Okay, you know, Annie was 13 at the time, mm. right? This is the language that, the ki that kids are mm. using now. And so we have to know, and we owe everybody in our community right. our you know, we have to come up, and I think that we know that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think that that's an important that's an totally. important thing about you know sort of lifting all boats. But, but one of the things, the point I want, I want to make very clearly is mm -hmm. that you asked me about sort of other social movements. Is that yeah. the most vulnerable outliers of every community that's struggling for justice and equality and freedom um, are the are 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 often the 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 people that are used to justify the discrimination against the entire group. Right, right. And the, the trans community right now, right, oh. the, we're calling these things bathroom bills for a reason because people are freaked out to pee next to someone who's transgender. Meanwhile, they've been doing it their whole lives and they've never had a problem so far, right? More Republican members of Congress have been arrested for doing things in the bathroom than to transgender people in the history of the United States. Yeah, more and, Republican, right, straight, straight 
Republican white, men, right, white exactly, men. Exactly. But the point is that, that, that we as a movement and as a community have to be vigilant about the way that we that we wrap our arms around everyone, such that in these moments of backlash and reaction where the people who are most vulnerable are targeted and raised up and exposed as the boogie people, the new enemy, uh, the new contaminant, the new freak, um, that we have to defend and protect and be in solidarity with those folks. And I think that that's something that um, not everybody in our community and our movement has kept their eye on. And I think we, we, we're a little late to the game in some ways, but we, we got to get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a last topic before we sort of open up to uh, the audience for your questions. Um, let's, let's focus on education here at the mm -hmm. end school and, um, and think about um, the issues related to LGBTQ students in schools, to mm -hmm. families, to the teaching of the history of rights movements, including um, the liberation struggle for LGBT people. Um, how do you all think about the obligations of teachers, of administrators in schools? What are you hoping to see happen <coughs> in schools? And what for all of us as educators, you know, are you here sort of advocating that we get serious about doing in our roles as educators? Mm. Well, uh, you know, the first thing I would say is I came into this building and I decided to go to the restroom to see how, you know, did I look all right? And I had a choice. I could walk into the women's room or the men's room, you know, and this is Harvard. You know, I go to Oberlin yeah. and I have a choice of four different private bathrooms for, could be anybody. And, you know, basic access, mm. you know, imagine you know, if we couldn't, if people couldn't get in the door because of their wheelchairs, you know, it's an access issue, right? right. Mm -hmm. So there's that, and that changes everybody's day. I mean, if you, you know, especially if you're a little kid, mm -hmm. um, you know, and mm -hmm. also, again, you know, struggles around addressing bullying and language that is used, especially in, in, for younger kids, kids in grammar school. And, and being responsive to that and being aggressive in your response in terms of saying, you know, this language is uncalled for, this is not okay. And it, believe it or not, you know, one, you know, bullying incident for a kid who feels slightly different, it doesn't just ruin that particular moment. It is the beginning of, you know, a sense of not being okay that can last for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I would I would I would echo this 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 notion of a zero tolerance on on any sort of bullying and, and for teachers and administrators to not um, you know not not turn aside because it's 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 difficult or it's painful or they have nine thousand other things going on, but for schools to be very clear that 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 you know bullying. Um, and taunting, or just, or, or calling, you know, that's so gay, or anything like that, just is totally unacceptable. And then I think it's really important uh, to um, to teach LGBT history in uh, in curricula um, and s starting early on, um, um, and 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 do it in a, you know, I think I think a lot of people can do it in a in a pretty matter of fact sort of way, and. And um, you know, in a state like Massachusetts, or actually all over the country now, on merit, you know, it's, it's the polling is all over the place. So, 60 plus percent of Americans support gay people, same-sex couples, right to marry, and then you have a third who are afraid of their kids learning about it in Harvey school, Milk, right? right. And, if, and then if you, you know, I'm sure if you asked, uh, or, you know, what would you think if your kid if your kid comes out, it's probably like 90 percent are terrified, or, or something like that, or you know, some high number. Um, so I think people are all over the place, but I think it's important for educators to lead and to lead by, um, you know, being willing to, to to be a little afraid uh, sometimes and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one of the things, you know, I hadn't come out much before I became an, an activist, and I was afraid like almost every day of, the, of uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I come from, uh, I'm, I'm Jewish, you know, I'm always, uh, there's always something to be afraid of, right? So it's, uh, it's, in my, it's in my blood, I'm anxious, you know, so, but it's, uh, you know, it's like, 
So I would be afraid and I would do it anyway. And I think that that's crucial for, for any sort of progress and it's crucial for teachers in the classroom. Um, so you know a parent might give you a hard time, um, an administrator, a parent might give you a hard time, a board member might give you a hard time, but just lay it out very clearly about why this is important, why it's, why it's, uh, it's you know, it, it, it makes total sense in the context of the curriculum and, uh, and, and do, it, do it anyway. Um, I also know just practically in, Ma in California, I, w I moved out to California after Prop 8 passed, the law that took away the right to marry, to rebuild a campaign. And um, around that same time, Equality California, the group I was working with, uh, got a law passed to create a Harvey Milk Day in, uh, in California. And just very practically, that, that created, that, that took, some of the, um, took some of the fear, I mean, that, you know, make no mistake, our opponents, you know, the right wing just opposed it like crazy. Um, but once, you know, t teaching around an individual like that is a, is a really great way to bring it into the context of a, of a classroom. That this is Harvey Milk, here's who he was, he was assassinated as, because he was, you know, because he was gay and because he was organizing, et cetera. Um, you know, and he's, he's one leader in the context of, uh, of, uh, of many. Um, so, uh, you know, in the context of many movements. Um, and, you know, I guess the last thing I'll say on this is, um, you know, I, I, one of the super poignant moments in the past, you know, over the course of this movement to me was, you know, when I was at uh, President Obama's second inauguration and he, um, <coughs> he talked about our movement in the context of the history of civil rights movements when he said um, from, uh, you know, from uh, Seneca Falls to Selma to Stonewall, mm -hmm. I mean, I just about, uh, yeah. plots, as my people say, I, I mean, I, I was about to fall over. I couldn't, uh, you know, I was, I was, um, I was so uh, so deeply moved. For it was on it was on Martin Luther King Day, and you know the African American president of the United States is putting our <coughs> movement right in the context of the of other great American uh, civil rights movements was exceedingly powerful. So um, um, you know I think that should give some oomph to educators to say, look, Obama's putting it in the context of other civil rights leaders. Of course, you know he's the president. Of course, I should be able to in the context of my classroom. Mm. Yeah, let me just say one very quick thing yeah. about this, which I always say that, that all of this, you know, modern political history of the movement and of um, struggles for LGBT rights and so forth has also been taking place within the context of the first African American presidency, who was the most far reaching ally and advocate on LGBT issues of any major presidential candidate in American history, and has, has delivered on nearly all of his campaign promises. I actually was a LGBT advisor to the president when he ran as a candidate in 2007, 2008, and- um, What did you tell him to do on marriage? Well, that was the thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, we knew he was in favor of marriage, but he couldn't be in favor of marriage. Right. right. And at the time, and it was, he, would, he would never have been able to come out in favor of that because mainstream politics is inherently conservative on those kinds of things. And so, but he's been, I mean, I think he'll go down in history as the, LGB, uh, as the LBJ of the LGBT movement. Um, and you know he's not perfect by any means, but he's delivered as an ally in ways that are really profound, in these symbolic ways that are really important that resonate, but also in really um, invisible ways at the level of the agencies and executive orders and these kinds of things, non-enforcement, enforcement, et cetera. Yeah, if you talk to trans leaders, um, you know, and, and some of the things that he's done quietly, I mean, the administration has done, have made a tremendous difference in the, you know, how, with respect to housing and discrimination within government, it's really been yeah, profound. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a mixed bag, because then you talk to transgender, you know, folks who are, have been deported, <laughs> right, and then there's a different kind of story. But, but, it is, but it is important for us to, to acknowledge, I think, that, because it's so, so infrequently does it happen <laughs> that an enlightened leader meets an energized electorate, which is what Jesse Jackson once said about social movements and social change. He was talking about the civil rights movement is that, you know, these great leaps forward happen at a moment when the energized electorate or movement meets an enlightened leader. And I think we've been living through that. I think it's important, certainly at the end of his presidency, which is historic in so many ways beyond that, um, to acknowledge that. But in terms of the school piece, I think there are a couple things. One, I've been working with uh, uh, this new youth uh, shelter in Harvard Square, Y to Y which was started by two of my former students here. And uh, many of the folks who come to the shelter are LGBT youth and LGBT youth of color, in particular, who are overrepresented 
significantly overrepresented, not just in Boston in terms of youth homeless populations, but across the country. In any given major city in America, roughly half of all LGBT youth homeless folks are, uh, are youth homeless folks are LGBT, LGBT youth of color and trans folks. And it's, uh, you know, that concerns me, that dynamic concerns me, because mm -hmm. schools are meant to be incubators and catalysts and uh, these places of inspiration. But we know that sometimes uh, schools at their at their you know most you know basic form are also safety nets, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how when everything else is failing, when resources are non-existent, when families are hostile, when churches reject you, how do schools become really the only place that can save lives, mm -hmm. um, and how do we as educators who are in those institutions handle that, think about that, and accept that profound responsibility, I think is a big question for educators. And it's something that my work with the homeless uh, community has been, has brought into really sharp relief um, that, you know, sometimes really keeps me up. Because um, I think we're, we're not serving our youth or queer youth as nearly as well as we can. But then there's another piece of it which came to me when uh, I was at the uh, 20th anniversary of the uh, state LGBT Youth Commission hearings uh, down at the State House. And when Deval Patrick gave a moving testimony, Maura Healy, my friend Maura Healy, our Attorney General, who I went to college with, we used to joke we were both straight then. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and there were so many moving testimonies, but among the most moving testimonies, in addition to the kids, the young people, um, who are so far ahead of us in so mm. many ways and so vulnerable in others, um, were the testimonies of teachers who could not be out, right, who had families, who were married, or who, you know, who, who were in love with each other, and, and uh, sometimes two teachers who were married to each other working in the same school district who couldn't be out, couldn't be models for that. I mean, when I think of the models that I had growing up in the 80s in the wretched Reagan era, of positive LGBT people, mm -hmm. there weren't any. You know, other than my grandmother talking about how Eleanor Roosevelt was different and that's what made her awesome, right? <laughs> like, my grandmother used to say that to me, this is the like indoctrination I got. Oh, Eleanor awesome. Roosevelt was awesome because she was a little bit different. Than <laughs> you know, but the, the, so the, how do we create, you know, is it even possible for all teachers who are out in every other aspect of their lives to be mm -hmm. out in the classroom, to be out at work, to be out in places where young people can see them and understand that there is a life out there that I can live and reach and be part of beyond my youth, which is so difficult. And then the other issue about history is, the, is like my newest cause. That I'm a historian and I've spent much of my life trying to figure out how to make hidden histories and invisible histories and stories that people discount and don't tell mm. visible and powerful to the people that need to hear those stories, which is of course all of us, but in particular those of us who struggle for role models, for representations of who we are in textbooks and in other forms of literature and educational materials. And it seems to me that we have got to make it a priority to get LGBT history and the, the history of our movement, the history of how our movement both interacts with, builds on, and inspires other movements. There's no shortage of things to tell, of people to highlight, of lessons to learn. And the only state in the union right now that mandates the teaching of any LGBT anything in schools and social studies is California. And that's a very recent bill, I think 2013, 2014. But it's been resisted in other states that have passed it. It's not the reality here. There's no other state other than California that actually says this is an essential part of how we should educate our children. And so we have to figure out in our own ways, in our own classrooms, but also some way outside of the realm of politics, how to get this into schools. So I've actually recently been doing some work with uh, Facing History and Ourselves on a unit on race and yeah. democracy and reconstruction. Uh, that's a really terrific unit, and Facing History and Ourselves is all sorts of amazing work in the schools. And I've actually approached them with, a, with a, an early stage and a proposal to do a unit and develop a curriculum 
around LGBT history that we could then do an end run around the legislatures with and get into schools through the vast network of facing history in ourselves. Hmm to try to figure out how do we get this in? How do we bring together scholars of, of LGBT history um, to come together to pick the primary text, to teach the lessons, to try to figure out how we can do intersecting histories with the civil rights movement, the women's movement, other movements. Uh, and I think we need to do that. I and mean, this is absolutely something, this is something that, that educators at the primary and secondary levels and at the university level can do together. It's a way for us to work together as teachers and as pedagogical innovators and as activists in our own right. And we have to figure out a way to get this curriculum into schools because there is no way you're gonna convince me that if we don't see, if we see ourselves on the pages of history, mm. we don't feel better about ourselves as human beings and as potential citizens. If we see ourselves as agents of change, we can imagine ourselves as those kinds of people in the world. And history can save lives. Those stories can, can change our sense of ourselves and our sense of what we can do as a, as a people and as a nation and as a world. Wow, I think that's a great um, note to thank our panel uh, for an inspiring and energetic uh, conversation. And now I'd like to sort of uh, invite you, if you'd like to, to ask a question by stepping up to one of the microphones. And I'll just ask that you please frame it as a single question that has a question mark on the end of it, if you can. <laughs> You're yep, it's all set. Thank you. Um, I actually had two questions, but I'll try to bring it back to one. Okay. Um, Obviously, we know that this is one of the most effective movements, if you will, in terms of changing hearts and minds very rapidly. If you could speak to sort of the strategic issues, I know <coughs> you mentioned Mary Benaldo's genius, but I think there's maybe some strategery, if you will, involved in, in thinking about like where and how to do this. Um, and I'm gonna throw in the second question anyway, which is, Personally, what was the most difficult part of all of this for those of you on the front lines? So the strategy and the personal. So I'm happy to talk about the strategy. Look, um, one, thing, one thing that's very clear is that it's not enough to be right. Um, if we, the, the pioneers who first went to, um, went to court to, you know, to be, to be married, um, in the 70s uh, were laughed out of court. Yeah. And um, you know, they made equal protection. The arguments that Mary Bonato made um, this past round before the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and the arguments that these folks made, of course, nobody argues as well, quite as well as Mary, but the, the principles were very much the same. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's the movement, it's the work of explaining who we are as um, gay and lesbian people, as same-sex couples, as families, as members of communities, um, as you know, et cetera, that is the work of changing hearts and minds to a place where you can get a, you know, a moderately conservative Republican or conservative on some things, moderate on others, uh, Justice Kennedy to say, you know what, these, these folks are part of the American fabric, the American dream, and need to be treated equally with respect to marriage. So it's all about um, um, you know, changing hearts and minds. And how do you do that? At the heart of it, it's, I mean, I think a couple things. One is personalizing, you know, making it, you know, sharing your personal stories. There's no replacement for getting to know someone who is um, LGBT. And it's not enough to simply be out on marriage um, or whatever cause you're fighting for. You have to talk about why marriage is important or whatever the issue is, why this is important, why the prospect of being fired from your job is something that you worry about. Um, you have to make it personal and you have to explain it. Um, and, um, and then you have to go, you know, strategically you have to be, you have to focus on where you can win. Um, you, you know, you want movements to be happening everywhere, but when, you know, as a national, you know, my job is, is national campaign director, we have to be very strategic about, you know, directing national resources to places where we actually thought we could win because we knew that the more couples who were married, the more families, who experienced it, the more people would see it, um, the better off we would, we would be. Um, 
and gosh, personal. You know, it's funny, I was, as you were talking, Tim, I was thinking one of the most difficult personal experiences for me um, was I, I spent one year, it was really, I mean, I'll be honest, it was the, really the worst year of my life. I was a high school teacher <laughs> um, <laughs> in a, at, a, at, a, at an urban charter school here in, uh, in Boston called City on a Hill. I'm sure some of you know it. And um, it was back when I was there, it was a conservative place uh, on, with respect to um, sexual orientation. And I, I, I mean, and, and I remember coming out to my kids, and I remember the headmaster of the school then um, set a rule that uh, nobody could talk about their personal life after I came out in the classroom um, in Boston, you know, and, and, mm. and um, so, you know, it's, it, it's I think, still the, the, the most, uh, you know, the most stressful times are the times you're most, uh, you're most vulnerable. So it's not, I mean, it's easier to speak to a lawmaker from my vantage point, and maybe this is just because of my makeup, than it is to speak to my grandmother or, you know, or, or your neighbors or, you know, it, so I think those are still the hardest uh, conversations. And I'll just put in a plug to follow up on Tim that, you know, I think it's very hard to think of yourself in this day and age as a real ally to LGB or T students if you are um, LGB or T and not out in the classroom. I think that, you know, it's just saying, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm supportive of you. I know, you know, I can imagine what you're going through. That's bullshit if you're, you know, it, it, it this, in this day and age in the, in the classroom. So I want to speak to the, the personal stuff and um, yeah. I'll try to be brief, but there were so many times that were so incredibly difficult. Um, Hillary and I had to debate the Neiman, you know, we were at a Neiman Fellows thing and we had to debate Tony Perkins of the Family Research oh, Council. Um, that was, uh, you know, certainly interesting. Um, I think the, the, one of the hardest moments, and uh, my colleagues here already know about it, um, was when we finally uh, went in, sort of did an action at Mitt Romney's office and went in there and sat down with him and tried, you know, it was sort of like talking to, talking to uh, a cartoon character or a blank screen. And so we talked about, you know, we went in and we talked about why we wanted marriage, why we wanted to protect our families, you know, same old story. And it was very clear to me uh, when he said this, that he had not read a single thing about any of our families, nothing. Mm -hmm. And we had already won, okay? This was between the time that we had won and we were hoping to be able to get married on May 17th. And this is how I knew it. I walked out of the outer office and I stood and I said, tell me something, Governor Romney. What is it that you would suggest that I tell my daughter about why the governor of her state is not allowing her parents, her mommy and her ma, to get married? And he looked at me and he said, I don't really know what you should tell your adopted daughter. Mm -hmm. I guess you should tell her what you've been telling her all along. Our entire story, I mean, people were so sick of hearing our entire story about how difficult my birth of Annie was when I had a complicated cesarean section. And I thought, you know, this, this idiot hasn't even read mm -hmm. anything. So when you try to reach out and talk to people who are the people that are you know, representing you and you're, you're, they're not getting it and they're, they're just stonewalling you, that is really, really hard. So my question is gonna follow up on that because um, you're talking about the difficulties that you face. Can you tell us about the emotional toll this takes on you mentally as well as the emotional toll it takes on your family? And then seeing what's happening now in North Carolina, how do you continue making this your lifelong mission, knowing that these things keep coming at you? And then how do you deal with this emotionally? I'm gonna hide under the table. Okay, yeah, I'm good that. with that. <laughs> okay, so I just wanna tell you, um, after we won marriage, after we had been marry, married, we went to, I went to Charlotte um, and then I went, I spoke at the Duke Law School. And what I realized when I, well, first of all, we live in a microcosm here. So if you think it's, it's tough here as a trans person, go to North Carolina, go to the South. My family's from Mississippi, go there. I mean, it is ridiculous. You know, the stuff that's happening now is, uh, 
you know, that stuff's been going on. They're just calling it something now, and they're trying to rally support around it. So um, it was the most difficult thing I could possibly imagine. Um, it, it is totally worth it. Um, and when I think about the people that I met in Charlotte, North Carolina, at the Gay and Lesbian Community Center, who could not be out at all, not at work, nowhere. The only people that could be out were the people who worked at Bank of America, because that was the local business. The people who worked at the post office, they were afraid to have a march from their community center. And this is in 2005 or six or something like that, because they were afraid that people would find out that they, would, they were gay. So, you know, it, it's kind of like with you guys, you know, if there's history, if there's some sort of model, if there's a community, if you have neighbors, if you can have a supportive, you know, um, family, which a lot of people don't, you know, that's pretty much, that's kind of the way you get through it. And, or you can be super pig-headed and just say, you know what, I believe this is right, we need to make this happen, and you just think about that every day. Yeah, I would say there are two pieces of this uh, for me. One is that I think there's an enormous amount of pressure um, on activists or people who are, who are in the arena all the time and sort of, you know, live, not, in, in addition to just being, you know, living in your body, living in your skin, living in your identities on an everyday basis in a world that's hostile in various ways. I mean, you know, for anybody who, who is non-normative in some way, who doesn't fit the sort of standard of what it means to be normal, what society deems to be normal in any given moment, has to walk through the world every day, assault it. And, you know, you gotta develop you know, strategies to, to, to heal and to fend that off and to, and to love yourself and find people to love you. And I think that's really uh, important. But there's also this way in which you know, once acceptance starts to happen in some ways, and I think the marriage equality rulings um, and the victories have helped, you know, move those of us who fall into those categories into, a, into more of a mainstream, at least tolerance, if not acceptance, at least recognition. But that then comes with its own pressures. And I, I mean, that maybe this sounds sort of silly, but you know, I mean, I remember, and I don't, my husband's here and who I love very dearly, but I mean, there's pressure on, like our marriage has got to work, right? Our marriage has got to be great. Our marriage has got to be strong. Like we're not getting divorced. We're not doing what the straight people did, right? We want to be just like them, but not so much like them, right? Because <laughs> half of them getting divorced. And so we, our marriage, there's pressure on that. Like when we got married, we got married by Ken Reeves, in front of 270 people in Cambridge, right? A week after the seven year itch party that Mass Equality hosted. And I mean, there was pressure on us in that moment. We're an interracial couple, right? We have family issues to deal with on both sides. And so think, having to navigate all of that and, you know, and feeling like you have to be better than, right? Like uh, uh, my colleague John Stauffer talks about how when Frederick Douglass used to dress for photographs in the 19th century, he had to, he felt the pressure of having to out-citizen the white citizen. And all of us who are on the downside of prejudice, on the other side of discrimination, have to out-citizen those that seek to deny our citizenship. And so that's, that can come with its own pain and its own struggle. But for me, what I, I, I gain inspiration from the elders. I gain inspiration from the ancestors. I gain inspiration from James Baldwin and Audre Lorde and the stories of Sylvia Rivera and of Harvey Milk and of Matthew Shepard. I was just at a concert talking about Matthew Shepard. I was older than Matthew Shepard when he died. His murder and death inspired me to come out of the closet. And now I consider him an elder, an ancestor, because he's gone way too soon, even though I was older than he was when he died. And so when I think about the stories of those who came before, all those folks who perished in the AIDS crisis and who continue to perish from the disease, when I think back to all those folks who didn't make it to here and who may not make it yet, the fact that I have whatever I can muster up on any given day to make it further and be a model for how to live and love freely and fully in the world, that's what fuels me. As hard as it is, it's what we must do. And there are all sorts of examples throughout history, which is why the history is so important, of people who have done that. 
who can give us that nudge to get out of bed in the morning when we, all we want to do is roll over and pretend that that world that's so ugly sometimes is not out there. And I just have a, a couple thoughts uh, that was really, um, I mean, both of your comments were really inspiring. Um, it, it, it is hard. I, I can tell you that I have um, permanent uh, nerve damage in these two fingers from my, you know, I remember my neck was so contorted in the last year of the marriage fight here in Massachusetts because we really felt like if we couldn't hold it here, it might never happen anywhere. And uh, that's the way we felt back in, you know, back in the, in uh, 2006, 2007. Um, and uh, it was, it was extraordinarily stressful um, and, and hard. And we just had to, you know, we lost, you know, we lost, in Massachusetts you had, you had, our opponents had to pass an amendment twice through the legislature. So we lost both times and then we beat it, we knocked <coughs> it down the second time. Mm -hmm. So the, the time between the, uh, the, the loss and then the rebuilding and the win was always the, really hard time. Um, getting back up. Yeah, getting back up. And I remember one point just driving around the states, it was, you know, it, they passed it on the last day of the session in in January of 2007, and we had uh, like six months to rebuild and going on the state. And I remember this one meeting in Lowell where everybody, you know, uh, everybody was crying at this meeting and they, you know, I was like, we can, you know, we can do it. We've, we, we went from, you know, 50 votes, we now have 142 or 138 votes or whatever it was, and we need to get to 150. You, you guys know what you need to do. We can, so it's, it's just, uh, the, the, you know, it's, it's, and I, I guess for me, the motivators were really two things. Um, uh, Tim, you mentioned the elders, and for me, it was always these um, amazing, older, same-sex couples who had lived through so much um, and whose, you know, whose relationships, uh, endured. Um, remember those two guys uh, who yeah. would carry their sign with them? Uh, 50 um, years, yeah, 49 yeah, years. Yeah, exactly. It was like, um, you know, 49 well, years together. Was, and right, yeah. But you know, and I, so I want to say, yeah. say something that in response to this also, even though I already did, um, because I remember that I'm divorced. Mm. And, um, you know, that actually answers Chris's question too. Because even though we didn't, when we filed the case, you know, we didn't get any mention in the Globe. Uh, when we went public with our mm -hmm. separation, yeah. it was above the fold yeah. in the Boston Globe. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to, you know, we got married not in front of 240 people, yeah. but in front of the entire yeah. world, yeah, right. right? And so it was international news, mm -hmm. and it was horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. So. I just kept having um, Annie's father drive me from, you know, first I went to the ferry. I got to get to P-Town. I can't possibly drive. Oh, no, put me on a plane. Maybe there's a flight. You know, I just needed to get out of town. Yeah. It was bad. Yeah. yeah, but I was, you know, so it's, it was these older couples for me, and then it was, the thing I realized at the very end I, um, was that I was always driven by this notion of my of the kids, you know, myself as a kid who struggled with coming out and, you know, spent way too long, um, you know, sort of struggling and tormented about it. And that's when we met. We had just. I know. We were playing out. gay softball together back in the day. We went to the gay softball World Series. We did. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, but uh, it was, you know, it was this notion now that kids in every part of America from, um, you know, from, uh, rural Tennessee and Mississippi and yes, North Carolina, um, who are growing up in an unsupportive church and an unsupportive family, at least they know that their government, their federal government treats their love yeah. and their relationship as equal. That is a huge difference in this, in this and country. Their yeah, and their, their president and, 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 you know, and that they, I just think that makes a huge difference. And I think that was one of the things that just kept me, kept me fighting. So we have probably time for one more question, but I'd like to try yeah, the technique where we get them both out and we'll just let our panelists respond to, to, to each of them. So can we go with each of the two questions? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Professor McCarthy, your statement about uh, the fact that we've kind of missed the ship or jumped into the fight a little bit later for helping the trans community as we were advancing rights for the LGBT community um, has really struck me as I have tried to learn to be more of an advocate uh, this year and an ally this year and an upstander this year. Uh, so I guess my question is a simple one. Uh, we, there's a lot of people who argue that 
the combining of the L, the B, the G, the T, and the Q uh, is difficult because there's so many different needs for each of those communities. So what would you say or suggest um, to individuals like myself who are trying to build community and who are trying to encourage those from each of those communities uh, to advocate for one another? Great, and our second question. I, I think it's a, a pretty good uh, um, combination here because, because my question is around kind of what's next um, now that we have marriage. Uh, and we hear about organizations shutting down because they lost their funding because now there is marriage and things like that. So there's kind of like a, a, a tendency for people to kind of step back and say, okay, things are okay now. How do we, you know, kind of keep, keep the fight going for, for what's next? Mm. Well, do you want to take that one, Tim? You wanna, why don't you take the, the what's next and I'll take the... Sure. Um, yeah. So I think from my vantage point, there are two, maybe two major things that are that are next. One is we need to protect, uh, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of things, but one is that we need to protect our entire community, LGB and T, from discrimination, from employment discrimination, housing and public accommodation discrimination. That's a, that's a real, um, that's a real big one. Um, it's, you know, it, it ultimately needs to be done at the federal level. Um, it needs to advance in states and, you know, uh, you know, when I was working in the movement, I would always talk, uh, you know, talk up a big bipartisan game. Um, but honestly, you know, we are stuck in so many states right now because Republicans have s control of so many state legislatures, yeah. and it's it's uh, bollocksing up um, many pieces of legislation in places. You know, there are great advocates and funders who are really involved in trying to get bills passed in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and. But these states are so, um, you know, the, the legislatures are so retrograde that even in these relatively blue states, um, can't can't get done right now. So that's um, one big basket of uh, of work that needs to happen. Then the second, from my vantage point, is uh, is the work internationally. Um, there's so many places in the world where, um, you know, people ask me about strategy. I was like, look, I. I talk to people about coming out and getting organized. It's you know it's one thing to do that in in the U.S. It's you have to you know in, in in so many places in the world just being out is you know puts your life at risk. And so we need to both here in the U.S. you know continue to use our um, you know push our state departments to um, to be active and to make LGBT equality part of our human rights policy. And that's one thing that that Obama slash Clinton did an amazing job of, really transformative. I was just traveling all over Asia and the guy in Cambodia was talking about how, or no, in Burma was talking about how great the embassy was in uh, Burma and giving them funding to help organize. And it's something that's not talked about so much, mm -hmm. but just the whole, um, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a big rest of the world uh, and in many, many, many parts of the country, uh, parts of the world, simply being open about who you are can, uh, you know, opens you up to arrest or, uh, or death. Yeah. Yeah, and just building on that in terms of the this international piece, because I think the human rights piece is really important and something that, that we're spending a lot of time talking about and, and discussing and debating and working on at the Car Center. Um, but one of the things that I think we need to do is, is, is to think about the question of resources and where, we, where our resources lie where they're concentrated and where they need to be distributed to. And one place of redistribution of the resources that we can raise and generate and mobilize, which all movements have to do, is to support the civil society organizations that are doing work in a lot of these areas where to be out at all, even to be an LGBT person is illegal. And so they can't do the work in the same way that many of us do the work and have done the work. But our work has to be in, in relationship and in solidarity with theirs. And I think there are ways for us to support with lawyers, with other kinds of resources, with money um, and sort of infrastructure support, uh, these kind of fledgling organizations or quite robust organizations that are operating very much under the radar and outside the norms of what we consider to be out and visible and proud and these kinds of things because there's some really inspiring work being done all over the globe that I'm, I'm, I'm just beginning to learn more and more about. In terms of your question, Andrew, I think it's, it's the million dollar question for social change and for communities. That, you know, every community has its fault lines of difference. Um, every movement has its struggles with, you know, different people who have different stories and different identity intersections and different experiences, lived experiences of oppression. 
I, you and I don't walk in the world in the same way. We do in some ways, in other ways we don't. And so we have to listen to each other and sort of what it's like for you to walk through the world and what it's like for me to walk through the world and, and then figure out what it's like for us to walk through the world together. And I think it requires a certain kind of humility that our experience is not the only experience. It requires us to be vigilant about flattening or universalizing experiences even within the LGBT community or the black community or the whatever community that those kinds of, that, that discourse of flattening out difference in an attempt to create or construct or imagine a universal experience, I think can be actually quite counterproductive and problematic. It can erase what is not powerful and what is not most visible. Um, and so I think that's important too for us to remain vigilant about policing those attempts to flatten difference and to pretend that we're all just the same because we're not. And then I think it's really important for us to, all of us, to be intentional about the ways that we close off spaces in communities, in classrooms, in social movements, in our politics, and in our relationships for those differences that can teach us something, that can teach us something by challenging the blindnesses that each of us has and the, the limitations that each of us has in terms of being able to imagine what a world where all of us could walk freely and fully as our own full selves. Um, but, and that may sound gauzy and, and idealistic and so forth, but I'm guilty as charged. I mean, I'm a historian of social movements who's walked around <laughs> as a queer kid and now a queer adult and um, still believes deeply that if we can figure out how to navigate all of these differences without killing each other, that we have the potential to garner and to create power that the world's never seen and therefore change in kind. It's a great note to end on. Will you join me in thanking our panel again? Thanks to all of you. And thanks to you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.